This is Scott Jones with casestacks.com. Today we're going to discuss cerebral venous thrombosis on non-contrast head CT. CVT is a unique challenge to both clinicians and radiologists for a few reasons. For one, it's a rare diagnosis, only affecting about 3 to 4 people per million adults. This accounts for about 2% of all strokes. Another challenge is that CVT is highly variable in its clinical presentation, with symptoms ranging from headaches to seizures to focal neurologic defects or even impaired consciousness and coma. As a result, the diagnosis of CVT may not be at the top of someone's differential and the diagnosis is frequently delayed. Any delay in diagnosis greatly impacts clinical outcomes, with patients having a higher risk of developing secondary venous infarction and or hemorrhagic transformation of the venous infarct. For these reasons, it's critical for any radiologist to understand when to be thinking about CVT and to be familiar with some of the subtle findings of early CVT. While CVT is a rare diagnosis overall, the incidence is much higher in young patients and in women. In fact, nearly 75% of all adult patients with CVT are women. This is likely related to two reasons. One, oral contraceptive use is a major risk factor. Also, to a lesser degree, pregnancy is a risk factor because of increased platelet adhesion and increased coagulation factors during pregnancy. Also, think about CVT in anyone with an increased risk of clotting, including those with inherited prothrombotic conditions such as factor V Leiden. Anyone with infection or malignancy has an increased risk. If you're reading a case of sinusitis or mastoiditis or any infection, make sure to closely evaluate the surrounding dural sinuses and veins for thrombosis. This is particularly true in children. In fact, over 50% of cases of CVT in children are secondary to infection. Finally, this is pretty rare, but if you have a trauma patient with skull base fractures extending to or near the dural sinuses or the jugular bulb, look closely for associated dural sinus thrombosis. To make the diagnosis of CVT, it's important to understand basic dural sinus and venous anatomy as well as the general location of venous drainage territories. The cerebral venous system is typically grouped into the dural sinuses, the superficial veins, and the deep veins. The major dural sinuses include the superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, the transverse sinuses, the cavernous sinus, the sigmoid sinuses. The majority of the superior cerebrum is drained by cortical superficial veins that drain into the superior sagittal sinus. More inferiorly draining superficial veins include the vein of LeBay, which frequently drains portions of the mid and posterior temporal lobes and drains into the transverse sinus. The superficial middle cerebral veins are another collection of inferiorly draining superficial veins, which are sometimes referred to as the sylvian veins. These veins typically drain the periencephal regions, as shown in the illustration. Finally, there is the deep system, which includes the vein of Galen, the internal cerebral veins and their tributaries, the Rosenthal vein and its tributaries. Together, these veins drain the deep white matter of the frontal lobe, temporal lobes, and parietal lobes, as well as the corpus callosum, the upper brainstem, the basal ganglia, and the thalami. Contrast-enhanced MR or CT are the preferred imaging studies for the detection of CVT. Depending on the preferences of the radiologist, these studies may be done with venous contrast timing. Non-contrast CT, however, is oftentimes the first imaging study obtained. Unfortunately, non-contrast CT is not sensitive. In fact, if the patient has a normal neuro exam, then an unenhanced CT will be normal more than 50% of the time in patients with CVT. Having said that, there are some findings on unenhanced CT which should make you think about CVT Direct signs include visualization of clot in a dural sinus or vein. Thrombus behaves a lot like parenchymal hemorrhage and therefore is hyperattenuating for about the first week or so after its formation. Just like blood, clot will become less hyperattenuating over time, making it more difficult to detect. This is a common reason for false negative unenhanced CT examinations. Here is an example of clot within the superior sagittal sinus. 
Notice as I scroll through that the sinus becomes focally hyperdense and expanded. This is thrombus. On the axial, this finding was more difficult to appreciate and only apparent on a few slices. Here the black arrows demonstrate a thrombose superior sagittal sinus and thrombose draining cortical vein. Indirect signs can also help you make the diagnosis of central venous thrombosis. Indirect signs include edema or hemorrhage in an area which is atypical for arterial ischemia. In addition, there are some areas which are pretty classic for edema secondary to CVT. While not specific, edema or hemorrhage in these regions should make you at least consider CVT and look closely at the nearby sinuses. These regions include the high parasagittal gray and white matter, the mid and posterior temporal lobes, and the basal ganglia and thalami. Since veins are midline structures, edema or hemorrhage in CVT is often bilateral. The pathophysiology of edema and hemorrhage in CVT is pretty intuitive. Thrombosis of a dural sinus or vein initially results in increased capillary hydrostatic pressure and vasogenic edema. As venous flow backs up, arterial flow will stop or slow. If collateral flow is lacking, then this may lead to ischemia and cell death. Parenchymal hemorrhage is very common in CVT, seen in up to a third of the cases. The pathophysiology of hemorrhage is likely multifactorial. If there's continued arterial perfusion in areas of cell death, then there may be hemorrhage. In addition, elevation of venous pressures beyond the limits of the venous wall will likely also contribute to hemorrhage. Let's review a few cases. In this case, notice the high density in the left transverse sinus, the linear high density extending across the left cerebellum represents a thrombosed draining vein. In addition, there's thrombosis of the straight sinus, and the vein of Galen. The hypodensity in the surrounding left posterior temporal region is consistent with edema and possibly developing venous infarct. The edema in this case is characteristic for the location of edema secondary to transverse sinus or vein of LeBay thrombosis. Here's another case of characteristic edema and hemorrhage in the left temporal lobe in a patient with dural sinus thrombosis. When you see edema in the posterior temporal region, think about CVT. Here's an example of hemorrhagic transformation of a venous infarct in a patient with known sagittal sinus thrombosis. As we scroll down, notice the small thrombosed and hyperdense cortical veins as marked by the arrows. As we scroll down further, there is a large area of parenchymal hemorrhage in the posterior right frontal and parietal lobes. Notice the extensive vasogenic edema involving the surrounding white matter. This is a typical site of hemorrhagic transformation of a venous infarct from thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus and associated cortical draining veins. When you see edema or hemorrhage in the high parasagittal gray and white matter, think about CVT. If there were areas of edema or hemorrhage bilaterally, this would raise your suspicion even further as CVT frequently is bilateral. Here is an example of deep venous thrombosis. In this case, both the internal cerebral veins are hyperdense and they drain into a hyperdense vein of Galen. These findings alone are concerning for thrombosis of the deep venous system. In addition, however, there is intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the right basal ganglia at the caudothalamic junction. This is most consistent with hemorrhagic transformation of a venous infarct. Although the thalamus is not the center of edema and hemorrhage in this case, remember that thalamic edema is a hallmark of deep venous occlusion and edema may extend into the caudate and surrounding deep white matter. Again, oftentimes venous thrombosis is bilateral. If you see bilateral edema or hemorrhage in the thalami or basal ganglia, think about CVT. Visit casetax.com for hundreds of additional interactive cases and a full call prep curriculum.